Your final performer of the first half. Please welcome Paul Giorgetti's writes fiction and screenplays for Bloomhouse Productions. In addition to being a live storyteller with us, you might have caught him recently at the Kith and Kin LGBTQ Showcase at White Box and Liberty Station. Please welcome Paul Giorgetti's. My sexuality was especially confusing for me because I always had crushes on girls as a kid. When these crushes became exclusively same sex when I got to high school, I blamed it on the fact that I went to an all boys school. I assumed it was kind of like the prison effect. What any normal guy would do in such a circumstance. But when I got to college, things didn't change. It was my sophomore year and I was 19 and I was sitting by the soccer fields with my friend John. When we were suddenly engulfed by the track team, we looked up as about 50 runners jogged past. Shit man, you see the tits on those two chicks on the end? John smirked. Dude, totally. <laughs> But I hadn't seen them. All I saw was the two dozen lithe and shirtless boys. Now this disturbed me. Boys had been starring in my elaborate sexual fantasies for years, the sole target of my lust. But the thought that I could be gay was ludicrous. I thought musical theater was cheesy. I hated shopping. And I was slovenly. <laughs> How could I be gay? <laughs> I just had the misfortune of going to a Catholic high school. And it had damaged me. And I needed to correct the problem. So I came up with a plan. I rationalized that the reason I wasn't pursuing girls was because I had this other avenue, masturbation. From the time I was 13, I had begun each morning and ended each night with a cleaning of the pipes, so to speak. And it had sapped my motivation. But if I could just stop jacking off, the desire would build up and I'd be pursuing, after, pursuing girls in no time. If I could make girls my sole conduit to orgasm, I would resume my rightful place among straight men. So the following day, I quit beating off cold turkey. <laughs> Two weeks later, I was hardly sleeping. I'd lost weight. <laughs> I would fly off the handle at the slightest thing. And much to my dismay, this little experiment had sharpened my lust for all the cute boys in my classes. But the worst was Tom Blesdo. Tom had brown hair and brown eyes and really white skin and an ass that was so tight and perky it was prehensile. <laughs> he was a perfect little twink, but he was also what was referred to as, in technical terms, a douche. He wore his baseball cap backwards, and he had a penchant for throwing things, food, bottle caps, across a crowded room. We were in the same anthropology class together, and though we didn't have anything in common, we became friends because we both, well, because I wanted to fuck him. <laughs> Every... <laughs> Every Tuesday and Thursday, we study together. You read what it said about the Sambia, Tom said. The boys suck off the men to get strength from their semen. Disgusting. What a bunch of fags. Maybe it works. Gross, dude. 
Can you imagine a whole fucking country of nothing but fags? I, I've imagined that. <laughs> Tom closed his books and stood. I'm going to grab some za. You want to come? Uh, I'll, I'll meet you. I need to finish something, I say. It took 15 minutes for the commotion in my pants to settle down enough for me to safely stand and leave the table. <laughs> that night, I lay awake, dreaming of Tom's calves while I struggled to keep from touching myself. A few weeks later, I was really starting to lose it. I felt like a trap about to spring. I was constantly on edge. I had to quit boxers and switch to briefs wearing two pairs just to tamp things down. <laughs> Merely reading the letters T-O-M in words like tomorrow, <laughs> customer, optometrist, made me instantly hard. But I would not give in to temptation only with a girl would I allow myself to orgasm. Then I met a vet. She had large hips and ample breasts, and her hair was short, and her face was somewhat boyish, and I did sort of maybe find her attractive. My strategy had worked, I thought. So we started hanging out. I enjoyed her company, but the end of the night was always an anxious, unbearable time, for I knew from movies and television that this was the time that the man was expected to steal a kiss, when things progressed to your place or mine. But somehow, I always found a way to escape at the last minute. It would be the end of the night, and things would be winding down, and I could sense a vet waiting for me to make a move. Then I'd spot a bus pulling to the curb. Shit, my bus, I'd yell and <laughs> run off to catch it. Bid a quick goodbye. There were always departing rides with friends I needed to take, unforeseen circumstances to suddenly pull me away. And if we were at a party, I would just secretly leave. In November, my house decided to have a potluck, and I invited a vet. The guests arrived, and my living room was filled with people. I was standing with the vet, nibbling on some Swedish meatballs, when I noticed that everyone in the room seemed to be glancing our way and whispering. I realized that I had backed myself into a corner. In the past, I could always escape at the last minute, but now a vet was in my home. There would be nowhere for me to run. <laughs> Tonight would have to be the night we did the deed. It wasn't just that I had no desire to have sex with the vet. I was positively terrified of it. All the sex I had before had been with boys and had taken place in my mind. <laughs> and one of the benefits of being homosexual is that you already have a lot of familiarity with the equipment. You've been taking it on test runs for years, but a vagina was a completely foreign entity. There was no owner's manual to tell me what to expect. I began to panic. I excused myself to go to the bathroom, but fled outside instead. What had I gotten myself into? I paced back and forth, wondering if I should just hop on a bus and go to campus. Then an idea came to me. I'd get out of this just as I had with swimming lessons when I was seven years old. I burst into the party, a look of pain on my face and melodramatically announced, I just puked on the side of the house. A friend came forward apologetically, and the bottle of wine he bought for a dollar was identified as the culprit. <laughs> I fled upstairs to my room. I lay on my bed, listening to the party downstairs, 
waiting for it to end. And when the last guests finally left, I heard someone ascending the stairs. My door swung open. Paul, it was a vet. Please don't come inside, please don't come inside. The wood floor creaked as she stepped inside. <laughs> Are you okay? I feel like I'm gonna puke, I moan in my sickliest voice. <laughs> I'll see you tomorrow. I'm leaving, she says. But I didn't see her the next day. And another week had passed and I still hadn't spoken to her. I had blown my chance. But I would not abandon my strategy, though something had to give. In my escalating desire and my lack of sleep, I'd become a little too hands-on with Tom and some of the other boys. Snide comments were made, and eventually they'd start to catch on. I'd be exposed, ostracized, hated. For Thanksgiving, my housemates went home, but I stayed. A vet was also in town, and I figured this would be my opportunity for a second chance. So I bought a bottle of wine, and I invited her over. After an hour, we were both good and drunk, and I found the courage to ask her if she wanted to come upstairs to my bedroom. She said yes. We ascended the stairs solemnly. Somehow, we started kissing. Our shirts came off. We fell on the bed. I played with her breasts for a while, but I knew what I had to do. <laughs> Flaccid, hands shaking, terrified, I moved to unbutton her jeans. But she stopped me. I tried to conceal my gratitude. <laughs> I met her gaze, and I saw fear in her eyes. I looked at her uncommonly short hair, at her man shirt thrown on the floor. <laughs> A thought entered my head. <laughs> A vet was implementing the same strategy as me. <laughs> I'm having my period, she says. Let's just cuddle. I search her face, but can't read anything more, and the thought passed, and my uncertainty returned. Sure, I say, trying to sound disappointed. <laughs> if Yvette had said, I'm a lesbian, as in fact she turned out to be, <laughs> I would have felt relieved. We could have relaxed and shared ourselves. We could have laughed, become confidants, friends. But Yvette was unable to utter those words, and I was unable to tell her about how I felt. So we lay there in our tense embrace, feeling confused, <laughs> inadequate, abnormal, feeling that singular loneliness when you are forced to guard your heart, when you believe that you alone must fend off the world's revulsion and disgust. Fifteen minutes later, a vet said she had to go, and I was relieved. I walked her to the front door, and I said goodbye. And when the latch had clicked, I fled immediately to the bathroom, thinking only of Tom, and if at least in that moment, nothing else mattered. Thank you. <laughs>